If you love tales of the sea, you probably have read many times of the Windward Passage. You traverse its salty expanse when you sail around the southeast end of Cuba, largest island of the West Indies. Should you go straight out from that southeast end of Cuba, as Columbus did on the 6th of December, 1492, and breast the intervening 50 miles of foaming, rushing blue water with its flying fish and screaming seabirds, you will come next to the second largest island of the romantic archipelago, an island wholly in the tropics. It is a cluster of steep mountain tops arising from broad bases on the ocean floor to make a heavily broken patch of terra firma about the size of our own rugged state of Maine. From the water level, though, the mountains are not very high. Even the tallest is under 9,000 feet. When Columbus saw this particular island, he called it Hispaniola, the Spanish. But the million or so Awak Indians who were there before him already had a name for it. They called it Haiti, Land of Mountains. The name still varies, for today it comprises no less than two of the republics of the Western Hemisphere. The Dominican Republic occupies perhaps two-thirds of the area. What appears here is Port-au-Prince, capital city of the other, the Republic of Haiti, on the western third of the island. An excellent harbor encourages shipping, and Port-au-Prince has the additional advantage of being on an important air route between North and South America. In Columbus's day, the Indians thought that he came out of the sky in ships that really were great birds. The Spaniards were amused. But today, strangers from afar actually do descend on IT from the sky. Port-au-Prince is IT's capital in all respects, not only in transportation or in trade. The imposing twin-towered Notre Dame Cathedral there is the spiritual center for most of the citizens. The impressive National Palace, where the president lives, represents political authority. And here, the National School of Medicine is a convenient symbol of higher education in a country where the population is approximately 275 persons to the square mile. That is a density greater than is recorded for any other republic in the Americas. The local marketplace at Port-au-Prince shows a much greater density, but it is merely the gathering spot of small tradesmen who deal principally in perishable foodstuffs for metropolitan consumption. One finds here, in rich volubility, that a special variation of French, which is called Creole. The people speak French, but over 90% of the population is of African origin. IT is one of the few independent Negro nations in the world. No point in lingering over the marketplace now, though. It's lunchtime, and practically everybody is stopping for a snack and a snooze. It is not especially hot, a breeze almost always blows in from the sea to keep the temperature at an average of 75 degrees to 85 degrees summer and winter. While the teeming marketplace slows down into its noonday quiet, we are given an opportunity to look into some of the other parts of the towns. Dwellings are not pretentious. Structures of more than one story are uncommon. But each is its owner's castle. It is the house of a free man. In that concept, let us overlook the rude construction, the lack of facilities that we have come to regard as our everyday conveniences. For these people have something infinitely more precious than material wealth. In a world that is battling the last stand of despotism, these citizens of IT, like us, are blessed with liberty. IT's memories of her upward struggle show most clearly in her popular celebrations. The signs are varied and interesting. They show clearly with but one exception. Where could an Anglo-Saxon maypole have come from? Your guess is as good as any. But these men with high ceremonial headdresses, how reminiscent they are of processional figures in days of the Spanish conquest. Here are children waiting to join the celebration, purporting to be those Indian Aborigines who greeted Columbus. Unhappy people they were. Conquered, enslaved, and worked to their last ounce of energy, those Indians died completely off in 25 years. They died mainly because they had known freedom and could not live without it. Whole centuries were to pass before IT would really know freedom again. 
1517, Negro slaves were brought from Africa to repopulate the island. The French took over in 1697, constantly adding more slaves to increase the yield of their large plantations, and by such slave labor, making IT extremely rich in trade. These grotesque figures are memories of that century of the plantations. Through the tangle of these survivals comes to the powerful racial origin in Africa, the chief factor in the mysterious, smoldering, shuddery voodoo of IT. Thus, the Aitians obey the eternal human impulse to remember and to drive home to themselves over and over again the outstanding lessons in their turbulent history. Modern things such as automobiles and jazzy saxophones joining in further to confuse the bewildered tourists. IT was the second nation of the New World to establish an independent government. January 1, 1804, when this was done, marked not only a birth of independence, but an emancipation from slavery. The greater part of the Republic is situated on two large peninsulas, and that gives a relatively small country an extraordinarily long coastline. It has no less than 14 seaports. Among these is the city second in importance, Cap Aitien. Columbus built a fortress here. But tourists come to Cap Aitien less for Columbus than to visit the nearby village of Milo and the mountain that towers above it. For Cap Aitien was the seat of government in the tumultuous days of King Henri Christophe. And his palace, which he called Saint Souci, at the village of Milo, was where he entertained his courtiers. Christophe was one of the black leaders who arose with Toussaint Louverture, freeing their fellow slaves and driving out the French who had ruled them for more than a century. On the trail above the ruins of Saint Souci, the tourists make their two and one half to three hours climb to the 2,600 foot level where a far more magnificent pile attests the glory that was Christophe's. He was a monarch then, self-crowned king of IT. There is the place, the century-old citadel La Ferrière. Christophe built it as a last stronghold should he ever need one. Actually, when he died in 1820, it was by his own hand, stone walls and high inaccessibility of no avail. He feared his enemies, and with reason. Back of each of the 365 windows in his citadel was a cannon aimed at intruders who never came. Yet, if Christoph had vast faults, he had grander virtues. As an administrator, he did much to raise his people. He established schools, built roads, encouraged agriculture. The citadel failed his purpose, no doubt, but it serves another that he did not anticipate. It is a solemn reminder to tourists who clamor thoughtlessly over the moss-covered ramparts that all North America owes a lasting debt to IT. It stands for the great change at the opening of the 19th century in Europe's attitude toward the New World, the end of her fond dreams of American conquest, the train of disasters that Christophe and his fellows caused the French persuaded Napoleon that the price of Western Empire was too great. He suddenly decided to sell out the United States, making the Louisiana purchase from him for $15 million. So perhaps to those who use more than their eyes in looking at IT, there is neither stick nor stone nor living thing in all the Republic which does not somehow symbolize the spirit of our own liberty. Our proud history might be far less than it is if Christoph and his fellows had never lived or had prized their freedom less. <laughs>